Hi there, this is Stephen Graves from Decrypt. I am joined by Hugo Fillion, the CEO and co-founder of Flare Network, the blockchain for data. Um, Hugo, just to, to kick things off, um, you've, you've described Flare as a third generation blockchain. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, I, we characterize it as follows. If you think about the first blockchains, um, things like Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, similar kind of uh, blockchains, uh, they allow you to make very simple transactions. Uh, Ethereum and other smart contract platforms like Solana came along afterwards uh, and they uh, enable people to uh, essentially uh, integrate a virtual machine into the blockchain. Uh, Flare takes that a step further by integrating data into the blockchain. So to give you a very simple analogy, uh, when Bitcoin launched, uh, there was uh, a kind of lottery, uh, but that lottery relied on an external person uh, picking winners, uh, hopefully using some form of uh, random number generator. Um, and today's data on second generation blockchains like Ethereum, uh, Solana and all of the other, you know, just uh, standard virtual machine blockchains, uh, that they're essentially in a similar manner. Uh, there is an external party um, which may be decentralized or may not be decentralized, uh, putting data onto the chain so that people can use it. Flare integrates that into the chain so that the data is coming natively from the chain. I mean, we're talking a lot about data here. Why is data actually needed for blockchain adoption? So if you think about um, really what we want to do, what we think we want to do, what we've seen happen in the industry, there's really only a very few things you can do without data. The first is, um, you know, you can make a simple transaction. Uh, the second is you can use an AMM. Uh, AMM doesn't need an external data source. But as soon as you get into lending, uh, borrow, lending and borrowing, um, into perps markets, uh, into gaming, uh, into AI, into anything else that is a little more complex than just uh, straightforward AMMs uh, and simple transactions, uh, you, you start to need data. And so data powers pretty much most of the value of the current use cases. Um, and we think most of all of the future value that will be built in, in the industry. And in terms of decentralized on-chain data, I mean, how does this address the problems with the, the data that's provided by the, the oracles of today? Uh, so today's oracles sit uh, essentially external to the chain. Uh, to give you a really simple example, between Chainlink and PIF, the worst served uh, uh, data item uh, from those two uh, protocols only has five entities that are serving the price. Uh, now, in, in blockchain, we've figured out how do we get a group of individuals together um, to adequately and safely uh, insert data onto a chain. Um, and we figured out how to do that by using a blockchain, uh, use, the de use the tools of decentralization that we know work in order to give yourself decentralized data. Um, the, the problem with having an external entity providing the data is that you can't be certain how that, how that works. Um, and today's uh, oracles have not really been um, looking strongly at security and decentralization and usability. So if I'm a developer trying to use Chainlink or uh, you know, any of the other data services, not only do I have to figure out how to integrate that, uh, but I've also got to figure out if, the if they firstly have the data I need, and secondly, whether the data I need has enough people serving it for me to feel at least moderately comfortable with the risk. Whereas on Flare, all the data comes directly from the network. Uh, it's provided by all of the data providers, so all of our validators provide all of the data uh, collectively. Uh, using which, and they're all backed by stake in the traditional sort of proof of stake based uh, mechanism. And you've described the process as enshrining the oracles onto the blockchain. So can you expand a little bit on what enshrined oracles are and how they work? So um, enshrining just means providing a service on chain that is essentially native to the chain. Um, there, there are other forms, uh, you know, other things that are enshrined within the ecosystem, uh, not, not, not necessarily on Flare, but uh, on, on other networks. Uh, and there's lots of conversations about what should be enshrined and what shouldn't be enshrined on the blockchain. Well, we chose to enshrine data because we think it's absolutely critical to the industry. Uh, so 
trying to explain this is very simple. Uh, Flare has about 100 validators, um, or traditionally what they're called validators. We call them infrastructure providers. We call them infrastructure providers because they're not only providing validation, they're also providing data to the network. All those validators are staked into the network. They have to put up their own money. Uh, they then have to uh, get further stake from the community as delegated stake. So there's, for each infrastructure provider, uh, they are secured with stake. Um, and each one of those entities contributes to two protocols, uh, one which we call the Flare Time Series Oracle, and the second that we call the Flare Data Connector. Flare Time Series Oracle is kind of what it says on the tin. Um, it's for uh, time series data, principally prices at the moment, but could be for other forms of time series data. Uh, and the Flare Data Connector is for Web 2 data and Web 3 data. So being able to see what was, being able to bring onto Flare what has happened on Ethereum, on XRP, on Bitcoin, um, and you know, uh, Web 3 data being able to essentially, uh, with a bit more safety, prove something from an API. So diving into the uh, the Flare Time Series Oracle, can you uh, can you go into a little more detail on the mechanics of how that works? Yeah, absolutely. There's two feeds within the FTSO. Uh, the first is what we call anchor prices. Uh, and this is every 90 seconds where all of the validators come together, submit their prices, uh, and we find a, a weighted median weighted by stake. Uh, and then in between those prices, uh, uh, although consistent, uh, is what we call the block latency feeds. Uh, block latency feeds are really interesting way to get um, uh, updated data uh, every single block for every single price. And we can handle a thousand prices currently. Uh, and the way they work is they they randomly select through cryptographic sortition uh, at one of the infrastructure providers per block, uh, one or more, more depending on whether there are incentives, uh, additional incentives given for vol to, to add additional volatility to the series. And uh, each selected provider uh, can add what's known as a delta uh, to the last price. Uh, and the delta is fixed, so they can go up, down, or flat. Um, and uh, although it sounds incredibly uh, limiting, uh, if you actually look at the prices relative to, uh, you know, say finance or a, a combination of the feeds, uh, we've we've managed to achieve with very very low, um, uh, you know, compute requirements, uh, uh, an immensely uh, accurate set of price feeds, and and and, and that's a really nice protocol. So one of the methods that's used to, um, I guess, secure oracles conventionally is, is restaking. So why is enshrining um, a preferred solution over restaking oracles? Uh, so restaking introduces the risk of slashing from, uh, from, from the base layer, um, which means that uh, you are not certain how much value you were going to have uh, uh, essentially securing any particular validator or set of oracles or set of uh, infrastructure providers at any time. Um, it's essentially a little bit like, you know, using more and more financial engineering. Uh, you may think that a risk isn't large, uh, but it can become very, very large very quickly. Um, and you don't really want to be in a position where, you know, with uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of value and hopefully trillions of dollars of value in the future in DeFi and in, you know, relying on Oracle prices where suddenly you could have a, a slashing event uh, that means that uh, your security, what you thought was your security, suddenly changes. Enshrining it directly so it takes the layer one, the stake of the layer one, uh, uh, means that this isn't an issue. So we've talked uh, a bit about the the underpinnings of a Flare network. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, the propositions. What what are some of the opportunities unlocked by uh, by Flare network? So we we're building a, a what we think of as the first collateralized bridge, fully collateralized bridge uh, for non smart contract tokens like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and XRP. Uh, obviously, focusing on Bitcoin, it's the original cryptocurrency. It represents about 60% of the total crypto market cap. Um, traditionally, uh, bridges uh, for things like Bitcoin uh, and other non-smart contract platforms have been fairly um, you know, centralized. Uh, the largest use of Bitcoin is with Wrap Bitcoin, which is essentially through a custodian. Uh, other people have tried multi-sigs, other people have tried things like MPC, but ultimately they all come down to a relatively limited number of parties 
and essentially trusted. We want to remove that trust by making the bridge fully collateralized, in fact, over collateralized. So what are some of the opportunities that this unlocks for sort of Bitcoin DeFi? Uh, so uh, this essentially allows people with Bitcoin uh, to come to Flare. Uh, to bring their Bitcoin to Flare or their Dogecoin to Flare, their XRP to Flare, uh, and to use that in, you know, EVM-based uh, DeFi protocols. Flare is an EVM-based layer one. So using them in uh, you know, DeFi protocols or in NFT protocols, or meme coin protocols. I, I believe someone is launching something similar to Pump.Fun uh, on Flare. So essentially just being able to start using those tokens in a way that they haven't been before. And of course, there are other you know, people doing this with Bitcoin. This is a very large market with a large amount of value to unlock. And we think that doing it as a, as a fully over collateralized bridge is probably uh, you know, one of the safer ways to do it. So looking at some of the other technical um, elements of Flare Network, you've spoken about trusted execution environments recently. Um, firstly, can you explain what they are? And secondly, what, what sort of purpose can they serve in Web3? Absolutely. So um, just set the scene. You probably use the trusted execution environment every day when you look at your phone and it um, and, and it automatically opens through Face ID. So trusted execution environment is uh, a secure enclave within a modern CPU. Um, they are trustless, tamper-proof, and confidential. So they allow you to basically process information uh, without anyone being able to see within it. Um, trusted execution environments are between 1,000 and 10,000 times cheaper than zero knowledge computation. So they offer a particularly interesting um, hardware secured way to be able to do more interesting things with blockchain. And why do you need to do that? Well, um, to give you an example, if you wanted to store uh, a gigabyte of data uh, on Solana, it's gonna cost you 10 million. Uh, and on Ethereum, about 60 million. Um, that's, that's just far too high. But yet, um, pretty much everyone in the world today is used to Web2 apps, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, eBay, you know, all of the all of the things, Twitter, X, uh, you know, we all use these apps all day, every day. They're processing vast amounts of data. Crypto can't compete, uh, but we would like to be able to offer, you know, high quality data rich applications, but with blockchain-like guarantees uh, using essentially the, the blockchain to ensure that the application is doing what it should be doing, that it's, you know, if you're, say, for instance, trying to build an uncensorable um, uh, social media platform, that the rules for censorship are, you know, in the, in the date, in the, in the blockchain. Um, and, and that... TEEs give us a way to start getting there. Uh, so it allows us to build essentially Web 2-like applications with blockchain-like guarantees. And how are you integrating them into Flare Network? Uh, so we're starting with just uh, looking at what TEEs um, you know, are available from large compute providers like Google, Amazon Cloud, all those kind of people. We have a partnership with Google Cloud. Uh, and we're starting uh, a, a process by which um, we're running a, a hackathon in uh, early next year uh, around an integrated TEE for Flare. Um, we're also looking at you know, where we can go further with TEEs, how we can uh, make it more seamless with the network. Uh, that's got a sizable engineering effort. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, a very interesting area for us to look at and, and, and very much on our, uh, you know, on our plate. So what's the sort of current state of the Flare ecosystem? What does it, what does it look like at the moment? So uh, Flare is emerging as, you know, we, we're building a, a DeFi hub uh, that is uh, meant to be providing new opportunities for developers and users. Uh, our TVL is relatively limited at the moment, but it's growing very quickly. Um, we have about 150 kind of strategic partners, um, including major infrastructure providers like Google Cloud, Figment, and Anchor. Um, we put a lot of time and effort into how can we make the DeFi ecosystem on Flare as safe as possible. Um, and we've integrated with people like Chainalysis, Elliptic, and Hypernative for you know constant DeFi monitoring. Um, and 
you know, we, we've uh, got integrations from bridges like Layer Zero, V2, Stargate, um, and Polyhedra. Uh, and we have uh, a large, reasonably, you know, mature set of DeFi protocols now that have built on Flare uh, for which TVL is flowing into. Can you give me some examples of some of the projects that are currently building on Flare Network? Absolutely. So uh, Sparkdex is a Uniswap, you know, V3 style um, DEX uh, that uses our um, our FTSO version two uh, in order to power kind of uh, perps protocols as well. Uh, Kinetic is a borrow lend protocol that also leverages our Oracle uh, for uh, for lending markets. Um, and Gnosis is uh, the first concentrated liquidity DEX on Flare. Um, Scepter is the liquid staking protocol. Raindex has built an intense like DEX um, so that people can kind of trade as if they're on a CEX. Um, XDeFi is uh, building a compliant futures platform. Um, and recently, last week, we announced Dinero, who are bringing uh, liquid staked ETH called Flare ETH to Flare. Uh, so you're able to use your Ethereum on Flare whilst, remain, whilst earning your uh, yield from uh, from staking. So we've talked a bit about the current state of the network. What are some of the uh, the future plans for Flare Network? Um, so we're very interested in getting our data onto other chains. Um, that's in process. Uh, we're looking at various options there, but I, I think we're very interested in uh, you know going through layer zero um, and obviously launching F assets. So our collateralized non smart contract tokens like um, Bitcoin, XRP, and Dogecoin. Uh, coming, you know, first to Songbird and then to Mainnet early next year. Um, and then lastly, you know, I think the biggest area for us is probably TEEs and verifiable off-chain compute. Uh, you know, we think there's some very interesting low-hanging fruit there, uh, especially in things like being able to make a DEX feel more like a CEX um, and, you know, being able to give fee tiers for users. Uh, and we're looking at how uh, machine learning or AI can be used for TEEs. Uh, fantastic. Well, Hugo, thanks very much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing uh, more of what Flare Network does in the future. Thank you for having me.